Okay, so I'm going to speak about ankle sprains and ligament reconstruction. Are there any disclosures? So ankle sprains are the most common ligamentous injury we see in this country, one per day uh, for every 10,000 people. And the literature has shown that as many as 20 to 40 percent of these patients can go on to have intermittent chronic problems uh, consistent with mechanical instability. So it's very common. The anatomy has been described already, a unique anatomy at the ankle joint and the talus body by being wider anteriorly you intrinsically have less stability with plantar flexion and internal rotation, which is the most common form of injury uh, for these ankle sprains. Um, there are medial collateral ligaments as well, but most of this talk will focus mainly on the lateral ligament this complex and injuries there. These are the primary static stabilizers of the ankle. The perineal tendons are the primary dynamic stabilizers. Uh, and the ATFL, which is the most commonly injured ligament, this is our primary restraint to inversion and plantar flexion. And this actually lies within the capsule layer. So as I'll show, this actually you can see very well um, uh, at the time of surgery. Um, and the calcanofibular ligament is primary strength to inversion neutral and dorsiflexion. It's a little bit more posterior in line with the super, superior perineal retinaculum, and this spans both the ankle and the subtalar joint. Uh, the posterior talofibular ligament is the strongest and is uh, rarely uh, injured. Um, again, these injuries are more common laterally, a uh, very common injury in the sports world, especially in basketball and soccer, and one-third of our uh, West Point cadets sustain an ankle sprain at some point in their tenure. When we're looking to grade these, again, the ATFL is the most commonly injured ligament, and the grading is a classification here that was modified somewhat a few years ago based on uh, the number of ligaments that are injured, the amount they're injured, the amount of pain, and the ability of the patient to walk. We examine the patients, uh, sometimes on the field, sometimes in your office. Uh, you're looking for bony tenderness, which is really our indication to consider x-rays. You palpate the, uh, the ligaments to see which ones may be injured. You could do your um, stress tests. Um, which are sensitive for injury, but not necessarily predictive, um, always of the instability. Um, and a squeeze test, again, as the Dr. Anderson alluded to, for syndesmosis. We look at x-rays. I think, again, routinely we don't necessarily get x-rays. Certainly, if you see patients that are coming for more chronic ankle instability, you get your series of x-rays. And we have numerous landmarks uh, that we look for to make sure that there's no um, obvious instability on regular x-rays. Um, stress x-rays, while I don't take these routinely in the office, sometimes patients come in with films from the outside. Sometimes patients may present with a Taylor tilt x-ray like this just from their natural laxity. Um, you always want to try and compare it to the other side uh, to see if there's any uh, uh, asymmetry. Uh, in addition, if you have access to a fluoroscopy machine in your office or in the OR, you can also do additional stress views to see uh, if there is instability in the ankle joint but also other joints as well. MRI is really rarely indicated in, the, in an acute setting. Um, sometimes with elite athletes, it can help us guide uh, their recovery in terms of time out of the sports and time for the rehab. Uh, it's more helpful, um, as I discussed, more with chronic painful instability. So in general, insta uh, the, the problem with chronic ankle instability is really a problem of instability rather than pain. When you have patients that present more with pain rather than the instability, then you're thinking uh, more of other things that might be bothering, whether it's a tendon injury, uh, an osteochondral lesion, possible impingement or possible coalition. Uh, but MRI can help very much with a lot of other commonly misdiagnosis. So if you're distracted by the swelling along the lateral ankle ligaments, the patient could really have a perineal tendon injury, an Achilles injury, an osteochondral lesion of the talus, as I mentioned, also some commonly missed fractures, including uh, the snowboarder's fracture. So you always want to make sure that you, you look out for these other potential diagnoses as well. Um, the gold standard for treatment still remains non-operative treatment, so we all follow RICE and physical therapy program, and so uh, you want to be very aggressive with your therapy program, proprioceptive training and perineal strengthening. Um, usually I put patients in braces for at least six weeks following a severe sprain, and you can see here that many athletes can wear these low-profile active braces during their sport activities. And acute surgical repair is not supported by the literature. Now, obviously, all ankle sprains are not the same. So the concern here is that you sustain a severe injury, and the problem is they don't completely heal. Patients will have recurrent buckling, giving way, and again can lead to severe so other injuries, but also specifically ankle arthritis. So you want to make sure you can treat them earlier to stabilize them again. And that's because, again, somewhere between 20 and 40 percent will have persistent mechanical instability um, after these injuries. And so we know already this is a very common injury. And obviously, over time, you want to make sure that the patients don't go on to develop the symptomatic chronic instability. And again, as I mentioned, those symptoms are really that of instability. They feel that the ankle rolls much easier. Sometimes it rolls just on the pebble. Or in New York City, it rolls on a crack in the sidewalk. Um, and you can, uh, sometimes these uh, provocative tests, like the drawer test, the Taylor tilt, is not always as positive as, as it might have been acutely because it's scarred in. Um, and of course, you want to also examine the patient's alignment, because uh, certainly if a patient has a, a hind foot that looks like this, 
um, any type of uh, uh, reconstruction is going to fail. So you may need to make sure that you address the hind foot alignment as well. In terms of surgical procedures, historically there are many tina desing or check grain type procedures uh, that are all listed here. Many use the, some are part of the perineal tendons. Um, and these uh, these surgeries did well, 80-85% excellent good results throughout the literature, but long term these results deteriorated over time. And part of it was that it was felt that they sacrificed some normal anatomic structures, and part of it they did have higher complication rates than anatomic repairs, namely residual eversion weakness, although some of that's been refuted using some partial tendons, autographs, but also abnormal subtalar anchor joint kinematics, decreased range of motion, and uh, other uh, wound infection, dehiscence, and sural nerve injuries. So when we think about uh, today what the gold standard is, is we're talking about surgical repair is really an anatomic repair, anatomic reconstruction to try and most closely reapproximate what the normal anatomy is for that ankle. Uh, and in general, a lot of these procedures are technically simple, um, and the gold standard has been the modified Brostrom procedure. Um, so this is really a repair of the ACFL and possibly the CFL. We like to reinforce this uh, with the inferior extensor retinaculum, uh, and depending on how you fix it, whether it's end to end or um, you could suture drill holes in the fibula or use suture anchors, which is my preference, um, to provide stability to the ankle. So the way I do this, I use this with regional anesthesia, typically a popliteal and saphenous block. I, patient, I place the patient supine like this. I put bolsters under the hip as well as the knee and the ankle, and I have the heel floating there to avoid any type of forward ankle displacement so that I don't place the patient in kind of a pseudo anterior drawer position when I'm planning on repairing it. Um, I started out using the anterior J. Now I've gone primarily to the extensile uh, perineal uh, incision to address more uh, perineal pathology, which I found more common in my practice. You want to make sure that you have a full thickness approach all the way down to the capsule. Uh, and then you've at first mobilized the lateral segment of the inferior extensor retinaculum, as you can see in the middle picture there, for later repair. I always examine the perineal tendons. Um, I see a lot of tenus side device. You will see some low-lying muscle bellies, which you can resect. You will see occasionally perineus quartius uh, that can cause some problems. And in general, the tears, we use the 50-50 rule. So typically, a split tear is more likely the perineus brevis. A full tear typically more likely the perineus longus. Um, I divide the capsules and ligaments, leaving a 2-3 millimeter cuff and distal fibula. Uh, and then I elevate a subperiosteal sleeve off the distal fibula. I freshen up the distal uh, fibula uh, to improve my bone healing for anchors. And I usually place one or two anchors retrograde into the distal fibula at the site of the origin of the ligaments. And you can see here that there is a shared common insertion of the ATFL and the CFL. You can see even the CFL even though it mimics the alignment of the superficial perineal retinaculum, it's really not exactly on the tip of the fibula. It really is just a touch anterior. So you want to try and recreate the alignment as best as possible. <clears throat> and once I have my anchors in place, I choose to use a, a slightly larger anchor because a few years ago I was getting a lot of uh, uh, pull out with the smaller anchor. So I use a three, mil three millimeter anchor um, with a five wire suture. And I usually, with my, I do three passes of the sutures with the foot and dorsiflexion slight eversion. So my first pass, I grab the ligaments in the capsule, I secure it to distal fibula. My second pass, I then go retrograde, and I secure the periosteal sleeve in a pants over vest fashion. And my final pass, I capture and reef the inferior extensor retinaculum. Now, what about doing ankle arthroscopy at the same time? So an arthroscopic exam can be beneficial. It's been shown uh, in numerous studies that high number of patients who have instabilities, chronic instability, will have associated problems. Uh, and really only 20% of these can be seen adequately at the open procedure. And this has been shown throughout the literature as listed here. So it's become really routine in my practice that I will scope um, these patients uh, at the time of surgery. Um, I place them again supine, I bump them. Um, I use, I typically use a 3.5 millimeter arthroscope. These patients are in, unstable, so typically you don't need a distraction. They are a little bit looser, so I don't need to use distraction, but if I have to, I will use a non-invasive distractive method. And I'll address the pathology typically as, as quickly as I can. So you want to act quickly. You don't want to have too much extravasation of the fluid. And once I'm done, then I'll close the portals, I actually reprep the whole ankle, uh, and then I'll change my gloves and move on to the open part of the procedure. In terms of doing this uh, all inside or arthroscopically, I think uh, foot and ankle is moving in that way, just as our colleagues have in the shoulder and the knee. And you can see a similar timeline in the 1990s, really in the shoulder and the knee, everything was done open. And now in that uh, realm, we're doing everything pretty much inside. And similarly, there have been some smaller studies in the last few years that have looked at arthroscopic uh, brostrum repairs. And here are some of the studies that have shown um, um, good results uh, requiring accessory portals. Um, the bottom study here was a capsular shrinkage study, 
um, which uh, we don't necessarily recommend. Um, there have also been knot lists. Uh, anchors have been used as well for an anatomic repair utilizing accessory anterolateral portal. They actually showed good uh, results as well, even though they did not include the inferior extensor anaglum, though the bulk of the literature does support incorporating that uh, and reefing it over. And the arthroscopic technique was uh, described by Mangone using two anchors in the anterior inferior distal fibula. So you should use your standard portals. You can use an accessory portal if you want. You put you see the anterior distal fibula and you put two anchors, uh, one kind of on top of each other. You will incorporate uh, the inferior extensor retinaculum and the ATFL and the capsule. So one anchor goes through the retinaculum, one will go through the ATFL, the capsule, and the retinaculum. Uh, you imbricate the capsule, you have to bring out the sutures through the skin and make a small incision so you can tie down the sutures. And that's what you can see here. And in their study, they found no recurrences in 22 ankles, um, increase in the AFS scores. Uh, and really minimal complications. Um, they had, did have one sural neuritis in that study. Um, when you looked at the follow-up, however, the follow-up was really not much quicker uh, compared to the open um, Brostrom procedure. Um, Cotton this year published this study as well in 40 patients, and they showed significant improvements as well. Again, one case of an entrapped nerve. Giza also looked at this and found comparing open arthroscopic really showed no real differences in the strength or stiffness or torque to failure. So I think in general, as we evolve, we're seeing that all arthroscopic lateral ligament repair may be becoming more technically reproducible. Uh, you definitely want to include the inferior extensor retinaculum because it does provide uh, additional tailor and subtalar inversion stability. And some of the pre preliminary studies have shown adequate strength between the two techniques. In terms of using any type of augmentation uh, for lateral ankle instability, I think that these are some of the situations you might consider that. And uh, I'm sure at the panel, some of our um, colleagues can discuss uh, what they use in some of their high demand heavy athletes. Um, but certainly uh, in revisions, uh, patients have inadequate local tissue. High demand uh, patients, such as athletes, if they're overweight, patients who have a long history of instability with a collagen vascular disease, that might be good candidates as well. And also, uh, it's divided whether maybe workers' comp patients might be good uh, patients for this type of option. So we do have a lot of different options, the autograft and allograft. There are other forms of internal bracing to use as augmentation, other types of scaffolds that we can potentially use. In my practice, I use this primarily in a revision situation or patients who are, who are grossly ligamentously lax. I prefer the semitendinosus allografts, um, and I do it uh, through this uh, incision, which is, again, the extensile perineal incision. I use interference screws in the talus. I use one in the anterior fibula for my passing tunnel, and then I pull it through and I tension, and I place the CFL in its anatomic location, and I will pull it through the tension, and I'll put it, place another interference screw in the calcaneus as well. Following uh, these repairs postoperatively, I use a similar recovery, whether it's a primary revision case. Um, the revision, I'll cast for a little bit longer, though, but I try and get them uh, moving as quickly as possible, range of motion. I put them in a lateral heel wedge in their boot at the two-week mark. We'll start with a dorsiflexion, plantar flexion, but I limit the inversion until six weeks, and then I start them in a uh, active brace with full physical therapy, usually back to full activities within three to four months. So in summary, these injuries are very common. Um, the most common presentation to the emergency room in this country. We can treat these most of the time successfully without surgery, as we know. Um, but some of the time, we do have to fix this about 15% of the time. And uh, even uh, patients that heal um, without surgery, again, 20 40% of these patients can go on to chronic mechanical instability. The gold standard is still an anatomic reconstruction of the ligaments, and you sh I would recommend addressing intraarticular <laughs> pathology at the same time. Thank you.